we are reflecting on the current state of South Africa. It is concerning. Since we've never really seen, not in our lifetime at least, happening in the country and in trying to understand what is actually at play, you hear different arguments about a protest, about sabotage. So we're speaking to people who've been here before, who've been in intelligence before, who've been in the ANC and who've led this country before and fought for this country's democracy to understand what is actually happening. Joining me at the moment is former intelligence minister, a former commander of the MK as well, Ronnie Castros. Ronnie, thank you so much for chatting to us. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, it is great to be on your program. And greetings to all the viewers. Ronnie, let's speak about what we are seeing. Um, I know as a person, as a journalist in any newsroom, we are struggling to process the stories we need to tell coming out of our country. As somebody who's fought for this country, when you look at the news and you hear what's happening, what comes to mind? Well, look, this is infinitely sad and depressing. We won't leave it at that because we can't just wallow in sadness and depression. But post-1994, when we won our democracy and it pushed apartheid aside, I really never dreamt that we could get to a situation of such dreadful and appalling scenes that we've seen sweeping through like a tsunami, KZN and Gauteng. And I just mentioned two provinces to put this into a more positive context, CD, because thank goodness at least, and we hold our breath, that this is not national. It's confined really to two provinces. And we'll come back to the issue of why. I'd like to interrogate that particular aspect. Of course, we have post 1994 seen some horrific scenes. And I refer particularly to the Maracana massacre, which in a sense, um, although focused in a narrow area of the platinum belt in relation to a particular strike was extremely local, but it was immensely bloody. And of course it was carried out by the security forces who executed so many of those striking miners. I mean, that was an immense shock. And it stunned me as it stunned so many people. So we have seen, just referring to that incident, but there have been other flare ups of protest related demonstrations which have got out of hand, where libraries have been burnt, public property burnt, violence has flared up uh, around the country. A storm of those things, which also pointed out to us, as Marikana did, that all was not well in the state of Denmark, as the Shakespearean saying goes. We never imagined this following 1994, as I've indicated, but the signs have been there. And the signs are socioeconomic on the one hand, yeah. and the signs are of the rottenness and corruption that sees the ANC, particularly with the coming of Zuma, which also was just a few years after Polokwane, where we saw four years later the Marikana issue. Two come together, there's a coalescence of, on the one hand, socioeconomic problems and crisis, which we've been predicting. You didn't need intelligence agencies. We were all predicting unemployment, inequality, frustration of the youth, the people generally, the hunger, that there was going to be what people refer to as, as hunger riots, bread riots. We didn't imagine looting on this kind of scale. But also within that, the rot within the ANC, so a political agenda which had been playing out 
from the time Zuma was suspended by Mbeki in 2005. And that was the, the succession issue to Zuma. And with it, splits and factions that were falling in place within the ANC, pulling it apart and with the alliance. That's a backdrop to looking at, at the situation and trying to analyze and find answers. I want to move from there, but before I do, I want to go back to the issue where everybody kind of sort of saw something brewing. We knew that all was not well. You speak about the social economic conditions in the country. Was there anything in your eyes that could have been done to arrest us very quickly in terms of the social economic concerns? You're an NC government that often is criticized, and I think I've been one of them, who says you are too self-involved as the party of the day, the governing party of the day. Is there anything that the NC could have done differently? to steer the country, never mind from its own play and its own politics, that it could have done in governance over the years to steer the country away from this particular point? I think what you explaining, what you articulating is absolutely pertinent. It hits the mark. The ANC, well, let me say this from 1994, because I was one of those involved. I would say we were rather naive. I would say there was too much of a complacency. We had toppled apartheid. We'd come to power. We wanted to do the right things. We wanted to do the good things. We had accepted, and this I think we need to, to, to realize, that there was a compromise that was required, that it wasn't the ANC simply taking power through a social revolution, which is what we had set out to do. And what we thought, we thought that the only way to dislodge apartheid was going to be in a mass people's insurrection. We were taken aback, although Dambo leadership and the Harari declaration didn't, um, didn't say there was going to be an impossibility of negotiation. And we saw that taking place. And of course, that had to be welcomed. You know, if, if you don't have the power of the battlefield and the forces where you can say, we'll sweep to power and then we will dictate to the old ruling class and its constituency, then there had to be some level of compromise. And I think that Mandela from a prison cell was far ahead of the rest of us and had a, a an incredible insight and that did save much blood flowing however cd when i say complacency naivety the moving into compromise i think we did too easily we gave too much to the economic power base of the country and then you saw enormous compromises made in relation to how we would change the economic power relations of this country. And that, I would say, is the root cause of the fact that instead of carrying on business that had presided in this country, those old colonial and then apartheid relationships, um, instead of radically changing those, and I use the word radical here in a sensible sense of not destroying uh, security of, of food and land and ownership and things like that, but of changing the economic system the control of corporate power, corporate companies, the way of doing business. The ANC started with an RPD, which was very positive, but it soon faded away. And we started having the gear program, which was what made Mbeki so unpopular with Kusato and the SACP and led to his undoing, by the way. And um, was not a economic system that was really able to radically deal with what Mandela said was our priority. And that was changing the lives of the poorest of the poor. So as the country continued with that kind of economic system, so we saw, we began to see the rolling out 
of the widening of the huge gap between the haves and the have nots. And the fact that as we speak today, and what I would say is the root socioeconomic cause explaining why there's been such a huge development of, of, of such looting in a spontaneous sense is because that gap widened with that widened unemployment, joblessness, inequality, um, and, and so on. And that's what the country is grappling with. You then link in the political schisms, because in the situation I've been contextualizing um, and, and the beginnings, which I've already referred to, of Mbeki's unpopularity, because he failed to take into account um, the, the, the position of labor, of the working class, of Kasatu, the Communist Party, and that's a very important constituency of the country. And there you began to see schisms taking place, which are, by the way, unforgivable, the way I would say the elements which at the time, we're talking about the alliance, we're talking about Vavi's Kasatu and Zimandi's Communist Party, linking in with opportunistic elements within the ANC who were moving against Mbeki for personal reasons, I would say in the extreme, the way he had um, uh, uh, marginalized certain people, certain leaders, Ramaposas and Sequali, uh, Matthews Poza, uh, and others who called themselves the walking wounded and the coalition of, of the wounded, as you call it. And, and that's where Zuma played his cards about being a victim, about uh, Becky blocking him from becoming president, and he played on that particular element of the ANC which wanted to see Mbeki dislodged, and that was the coming together of awful opportunistic right-wing elements within the ANC and, and the left, which is what led to Polokwane, and then the disastrous years of Zuma and the Guptas and state capture, which then followed, which are the basis then of what's been going on in terms of the support that Zuma has been getting from certain nefarious sources that are now being revealed as having been part of this absolute mess that has occurred, a criminal attempt to deal with the Zuma incarceration, to deal with Ramaposa, to capture or recapture the ANC by these particular, um, I would say, counter-revolutionary elements. Rory, tell me something. There's many things I want to pick at because you've now taken us to the political conversation. Um, what makes the ANC so vulnerable to this, firstly? I mean, why is it so easy for people to take advantage, the opportunism to emerge and for it to flourish the way that it has? And before you answer that, I want you to reflect on whether or not, as he is now incarcerated, has he done the same thing yet again? It sounds like that's what you're saying, that even behind bars, he's managed to take advantage of the state of the ANC once again to cause, I'm not even sure how to define this, as I said, Yes, well, of course, to cause havoc. And that's been the approach of the, um, of, of the Zuma faction, to create disturbance, to create havoc, to destabilize situation for political purposes, um, focused on Zuma's uh, predicament, a, a deep, dark hole that he has been digging for himself with the stupid advice of his cronies who thought that they could play this game of resuscitating basically a dead and a broken man. Zuma's shelf life has run out. Um, there's no Why can't they question. Do that? Pardon? 
Why can't they see that? I looked at Zoom on Sunday before you went to jail, before he was arrested, and I looked around. You speak about the alliance at a time where there was a Vavi, a Blade in Zimande, where there was a period where Julius Malema led. There was a there was a stronghold of people who led very serious big structures who were on his side in the 2008-07 period that he no longer has. There's also that question around how powerful this man remains. I watched him on Sunday before he was arrested, and Along his side was Colony House, Ace Mahashule, and Tony again. And that to me indicated that this man's time is up. Why can that not be seen? Why do we continue getting dragged into Zuma politics in 2021 when he doesn't have supposedly as much power when he was in power? Yes, well, of course, he's lost power. He can mm -hmm. never regain oh. it. Zoom is actually a grotesque mediocrity. We've known that within the ANC from exile, actually. And it's unfortunate that, that um, uh, Mandela ANC needed to have some, and I use the word unashamedly, it, it's an obvious, uh, an obvious identity issue of Zoomers, Zuluness, which is played on. It's not that the man tries to brush that aside. He always moves back into that particular pitch. And he plays that and has played it as, as much as he can. But he's lost power. He's lost patronage. You know, a politician without the power of patronage, of being able to give favors, of being able to buy people, which is basically how he developed from being just this mediocrity into somebody who had sycophants around him and saw in him the means in which they could graft their careers and could gain patronage, could gain wealth and power. That's gone. And you refer to those grotesque mediocrities surrounding him from ACE to um, Carl Niehaus, in particular, Kebi Mafatswa. You know, these elements, they, they utter grotesque mediocrities who should never have had any public stage or, 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 or profile. But Shakespeare has dealt with so many plays and epics which show those grotesque mediocrities and, and, and the absolute cunning they use and the way in which they can dissemble their lies and fool people. And what that crowd did, especially as Zuma, the arch target of corruption, was facing the possibilities of the law courts and Zondo. So those with him were being exposed and for their own self-preservation, they sought using lies, using radicalism to build up a political platform around him. I would say that a silver lining of what we've gone through now and the exposure in which, according to the intelligence minister, the state security minister, I under Lodler, who's someone I know, um, she's professional and she's experienced. I. I I, I, I'm, I don't envy the fact that she's not presiding, as so many ministers aren't presiding, over really workable functioning departments. But there is information that's clearly come to the fore, including from the social media, which points out to those absolute rogues who don't care about the country or our people. And they are being exposed now and for the president and for cabinet in the ANC, they have to move forward. And we hope that what the Minister of State Security has been alleging is something that can be presented and people can be charged and we can see an end game to the way in which these people have absolutely distorted um, the country has brought us to such a horrible point in time. Let me just add now, when I talked about two provinces out of nine, 
The interesting aspect is that those are the two provinces where, in fact, the Zumaites and those that he's put in place in the state, fortunately, many through Zondo and Ramaphosa having been pushed aside, like Tulani Glomo, who Zuma brought in to create a special operations structure within intelligence service serving him, which was illegal. And we know that there are such elements who have, according to the minister and according to social media, been pulling strings to bring about as a lighting of fuse, the initial response to Zuma's incarceration, and that was the burning of some 20 or so um, trucks on the, the motorway from Durban to Gauteng last weekend. And of course, what then followed, I, I would say, is something beyond their script and beyond their, 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 their any potential power. And, and that's a kind of insurrection bringing in millions of people who have, in a sense, simply spontaneously seen an opening in those two particular provinces to carry out spontaneous mass looting, which, of course, at the moment is the big danger, um, which the government have to put down and have to have the authority carried out on the streets by the security forces to push back the tide. And in that then, we'll come to the question, which perhaps you, I'll leave you to raise now, is, is, is what does President Ramaphosa need to do? Yes, what happens next? Okay, so in relation to this, there are two aspects. The immediate one, when a country is wrought by such civil unrest and instability and this criminalized looting is that authority must be stamped and it must be used immediately with its full power. And I say this as somebody who would never have imagined under our democracy, we would now, we, we might need things like states of emergency, and the military on the ground reinforcing the police. And there is an element of that where we are concerned, and that is the overplay, as we've seen at times, by security forces in dealing with the public. Um, but we need firmness and we need looters arrested. We need a stopping to the mayhem. We've seen a turnaround taking place in Gauteng, and we're hoping to see over the next few days that normality will slowly return because this abnormality won't continue. And the Zuma grouping have no real strength and power to carry this through any further. Um, so the first thing for government is that kind of firmness and resolve. I think one weakness we have because of those Zuma years is that these departments are not up to full strength. Their weaknesses there, the Minister of State Security or Defence and the police, etc., are battling to mobilise the forces, the powers that be, in the best possible way. And I think we've got a lot to thank those security forces on the ground. But in addition to this, we see coming back into the equation something from the early 1990s, and that was the communities linking in with the security forces to bring about normality and to protect the sources of food and supplies. And it's a key element which is going to be vital to government going forward to ensure that they're able to give a leadership to those structures so that there is a harmony between the way civil society and the neighborhood works with police, um, with, with, with the police and, 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 and the, the government. And that's the immediate requirement. Coming back to what I've been referring to 
as something that we we were anticipating, we were talking about how many of you in the media, the commentators, the analysts, the university people, the researchers, people like myself and others with, 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 uh, with articulation, if I might say, or who wanted to speak to the public, was saying, we can't allow a economic system such as the one we have in place that's widening the gaps between wealth and poverty and, 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 and not dealing with the unemployment issue, the fact that the youth see no future, the huge, huge poverty and hunger, that unless that's addressed, that South Africa can't survive in a normal way, in a way of building our resources, our human resources, our economic resources, our way of ensuring the distribution of wealth. And I'm not now talking about from Blade and Zamandi's point of view of raising a red flag and saying it's only socialism. That needs to be looked at because I don't see free market capitalism anywhere in the world having provided the answer to this insecurity that human beings are facing. So let me immediately then say what I'm talking about is something like Franklin D. Roosevelt, the president of the United States who led the United States out of a depression. And you'll recall from history, his recipe went against the current economic thinking of his day, which is all about austerity, free market, the role of the corporates to raise up the country, the trickle down effect of wealth that Reagan and Thatcher brought back into the equation with what we call the neoliberal economy, which is something, our big error, which South Africa fed into. And it's for Ramaphosa now, and I, I'm not just saying we believe in a, a particular human being, uh, but there's a new dawn that's been talked about. We can't just have the same recipe and formula peddled out by an ANC that appears at times to be in denialism in relation to the fact that we've been saying they're going to be bread riots. There's going to be mayhem unless we can provide food on the table. And what Roosevelt did was he brought in his new deal, that switch in the economy, which pushed back austerity measures, brought in spending, brought in the new deal, which is all about creating public works programs in which the masses became involved where people had money placed in their pockets, which brought food on the table, which brought a respite, which led America into a whole new economic developmental program at that time. That is one of what, what that is actually one of the things Cyril Ramaphosa was selling, and that's how he rose to power in the lead up to 2017. My last question, um, you've kind of given me answers about what happens. What sort of an ANC emerges after this, where it's allowed itself to be paralyzed by and large people linked to former President Jacob Zuma? Even now, where the ANC had to pause and reflect on whether it stands by the courts and law enforcement versus the former president, you find that they still tend to want to placate him. They'll say we choose the courts, but we love and support the former president. What does the ANC actually need to do to put the country, to put the people it says it serves first? Yeah, I think it needs to cut out that sentimental clap trap about loving the former president because he played an important role in the struggle. How many hundreds of thousands of South Africans paid a huge price, losing their fathers and mothers, their sons and their daughters over all those years? And yes, there were hundreds, perhaps thousands of us who were involved very directly in the ANC and in MK, in the Communist Party, in the UDF, in the mass mobilization of the time and the trade unions. We can't rest on our laurels. I can't say, 
I'm Ronnie Casrules. From 1960, I joined MK, and I did this, and I did that, and so on, and expect that if I, at some later stage, carry out crime against the people I'm supposed to serve, and simply become involved in my own family, my own glory, my own power, my own wealth, and I'm prepared to commit crimes for that. That indicts me. That means I'm a criminal and I must face the full might of the law. There should be no people on the side praising the past. We need to, first of all, accept that the man is a criminal. He's in custody where he belongs. He's responsible for that. He's got other charges to face as those characters around him who I've said are grotesque mediocrities. And the time is passe. Their shelf life is up. The ANC, if it is going to survive and renew itself and lead the country, and you see, unfortunately, one doesn't see any other meaningful vehicle. The EFF have disgraced themselves with the, their opportunism and their, their opportunism and their behavior. And the left, from the Communist Party to the trade unions, the new Vavi Federation, etc., they have to unite and they have to be part of a renewal of the liberation forces that stand for real principle and serve the people and not themselves. And this is what Ramaphosa's ANC, if they are to survive, have to preside over. So it's a big challenge for the ANC. And my only hope, TD, is that because this has been such a shocking crisis, shocking to our very backbones, let's face it, how we are appalled, that will this shake the ANC up and its membership, and there are good people there, will it shake it up sufficiently for it to really turn the corner and begin to represent, not simply the ANC, but stand for the whole country, for our new generation, for the born freeze, for the elderly who are suffering in those townships to such a degree, without bread, without milk, without basic foodstuffs. And an ANC then who has to buck the neoliberal free market system and begin to say that we will put in place a system that really does in every sense address the needs, the material needs, the socio-economic needs of human beings in South Africa, and not just the top 20% of our country. All right, Ronnie, thank you so much for your time.